Hey, Brian White is filling in for Buck Lavaster. For the past couple of months, we've been in hunting mode. Now is a good time to step back and take a look at something fishy. A while back, I paid a visit to the State Fish Hatchery in Marquette. It's the primary broodstock and rearing facility for brook trout and lake trout that are used in both inland and Great Lakes waters. We'll pay another visit to my UP Trappers Association connection, Bob Whitens, to find out how to skin a mink. And on this week's Only in the UP segment, we'll visit with a guy who turns wood into art. That's right here, right now, on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan arrived at the state fish hatchery in Marquette early in the morning to find the crew already hard at work on a stocking mission. The Marquette State Fish Hatchery was established in 1920 and completely renovated in 1994. It is the primary brood stock and rearing facility for brook trout and lake trout that are used in both inland and Great Lakes waters. They also raise splake for both Great Lakes and inland waters. To get all the details, I spoke with fisheries biologist Jim Aho. We got the 2009 broodstock. We took these by 2009 as we took eggs from contributing males and female, contributing families uh, of the 2001s and 2003s. We mixed them in 2009. We call it the 2009 group. They were born right here at the hatchery. Uh, the 2001, the 2003, and the 2004 group of lake trout, we took those on Lake Superior. The idea was to get a more genetically sound from an infinite breeding population, natural population on Lake Superior. So we went in and got eggs, and fertilized the eggs with uh, the, the males from Lake Superior, took those eggs, put them in an isolation facility for six years, and then uh, did health tests on them routinely, make sure they weren't carrying any bacterial or viral diseases, and we brought those into the hatchery now, and we've been spawning the 2001s, 2003s, and the 2004s here at the hatchery to produce purebred Lake Superior lake trout or we cross the female lake trout with the male brook trout to make splake. And then this year we're also taking a 2012 group by crossing all three groups and then we're going to have a 2012 group of uh, broodstock. It takes six to seven years to get an adult sexually mature lake trout so there's a little bit of planning in advance and then when the 2009s get mature we'll surplus the 2001s and then when the 2012s get mature, we'll surplus the 2003s. It's a continual rotation of about uh, three to four year classes of fish. The idea of going into Lake Superior was to get a more genetically superior fish. And we took 100 or more families from Lake Superior for each year class. And uh, just by accident, we happened to meet two individuals and that were probably carriers for the albino gene. And we got a family of albinos. We got about five of them here at the hatchery that we kept. We don't actually use them for breeding, but they're here primarily for show. All the raceways out here are run on Cherry Creek water. Cherry Creek is an uh, outfall of the Sands Aquifer. Uh, it runs from, from the back of Gwyn all the way up to Nagani. Uh, rain falls on the Sands Aquifer, percolates through the soil and ends up in the Sands Aquifer underground. There's uh, 
Cedar Creek, Big Creek, Cherry Creek, Silver Creek, they're all outfalls of the Sands Aquifer. Uh, here, Cherry Creek provides 9,000 gallons per minute for the hatchery. It's uh, been identified as one of the most consistent streams in Michigan as far as temperature and volume goes. And uh, it consistently flows at about 9,000 gallons per minute, and it has the water temperatures of about 3 degrees Celsius in the wintertime and about 10 degrees Celsius in the summertime. So it's perfect temperatures for rearing trout. We separate the 9,000 gallons to 3,000 gallons for broodstock and then the 6,000 gallons that are used for production. We never mix the two waters between broodstock and production for disease purposes. We also have the capabilities of pumping about 12,000 gallons per minute of water for, for our inside production purposes. Uh, and that peaks at for about three months in the uh, early springtime. Uh, then the rest of the year, one or two wells are on. And then it's summertime, it's, uh, all the wells are off. We have two effluent ponds on site. Uh, the purpose of these are to clean the, settle out the settleable solids of the, that we use. The water, the 9,000 gallons of water flows through the hatchery, picks up uh, uneaten food and fish species. And the settling ponds will settle out that uh, settleable solids. Spawning process is we'll take a dish, express the female into the, express the eggs from the female into a pan, and then take a ovarian fluid sample for health test, set that aside, that ovarian fluid sample, take the male, express the male into a pan, and take a sample of the milk for fish health purposes, and then we'll get results within 24 hours. We'll call any positive families, and then we'll take several families and uh, put them up into production and then we'll take a teaspoon out of every family and set that aside for future broodstock. So every, every year there's a contributing, uh, a large number of contributing uh, families making up the broodstock. So, uh, and then we always breed cross lots. We always breed the two-year-olds with the three-year-olds. Uh, so you never get uh, close cousin or brother-sister matings. And you, and, you re, and you retain some of the genetic integrity of the stock. The process is that we uh, took our eggs from, from uh, 230 some families, lake trout families. We uh, waited for the results. We got all negative results for bacteria infections on the adults. We disinfected the outside of the egg with an iodine solution. And then we bring the eggs in here and uh, they will be incubated for the next uh, two and a half months here. The, fish I'll be eyeing up in about another month. We'll pick out the dead eggs with a mechanical picker and then we'll put them back into the incubator for the second month and uh, then they'll be hatching around December. Lake trout we get about 80% uh, eye up live viable eggs. Splake we get 55 to 60% viable egg when we mix two species and the brook trout will get about 80 to 88% eye up. How a heath tray works is the uh, Designed very similar to a uh, adult fish in a stream situation. The adult fish will look for groundwater coming into the stream, usually at a gravel location, and uh, it'll make a red or a nest, and the female will deposit the eggs in the nest amongst the gravel, and then the groundwater coming up through the gravel will aerate the eggs and clean off the silt and keep the fungus and bacteria off the eggs. Here in a hatchery situation, they've designed what is called a heath tray, the eggs are stripped out of a female and fertilized and then put into a heath tray, basically a screen box. The screen box fits into a tray. Five gallons per minute will enter into the back of the tray, percolate up through the eggs, aerate the eggs with fresh oxygenated water, take out the uh, settable solids out of the eggs and then spill over and then the water will drop down to the next tray and it's reused seven times in the process and then expelled. Each year we take about 600,000 splake eggs to get a rearing assignment of 235,000 splake and then we'll take uh, about 300,000 lake trout eggs to meet a rearing assignment of about 150,000 uh, fish and then uh, brook trout will take about uh, 225,000 brook trout eggs to meet about, about to meet the 118,000 uh, fry that we want to release or spring fingerlings that we want to release. We start at half tank, low water, 
and as they grow, we uh, expand the tanks to three-quarter tanks and then full tank. And uh, when they outgrow the tank, then we move them into outside into 100 cubic meter tanks. Currently, they're about five inches long, and next May when we stock them, they'll be about eight to 10 inches long. We've had tremendous success with this strain now. We, they went through about eight years of cleanup period for bacterial kidney disease and frankulosis. Currently, we vaccinate them as uh, three-month-old fry, and then we move them outside at six months, and then they're outside for another 10 months. They're VKD free, bacterial kidney disease free, and frankulosis vaccinated. And that's, uh, they're putting a lot of energy into growth, and uh, that's paying off for survival for the fishermen. Marquette State Fish Hatchery was first established in 1922. Uh, originally, Marquette State Fish Hatchery was a sawmill. The site was a sawmill, Fraser Sawmill. And in 1922, the state bought the property from Fraser Sawmill. Uh, they keyed in on the location because of the constant temperature and constant volume of Cherry Creek. And then uh, in 1922 they started rearing lake trout. Uh, it was a cornerstone for lake trout rehabilitation of the Great Lakes. And uh, then we picked up brook trout in the uh, about the 70s air. And uh, we started rearing brook trout and lake trout. And then we started doing splake. And uh, the primary funding source for Market Hatchery is the license sales and the federal excise tax on manufacturers. For each license we sell, we get X amount of dollars, seven to eight dollars from the federal excise tax. We have an interpretive center on the second story of the Hatchery building open to the public. Here we have computer programs, uh, information, uh, Hatchery history, uh, different things that, uh, that happened on site over the years. Marquette State Fish Hatchery is open from 7.30 to 3.30 each day. We're open on holidays for uh, public self-guided tours and open to uh, requests on group, group tours. <laughs>《The Wood Tick Music Festival》在 s v i l l e Michigan。Four days of great bluegrass, country, folk, blues, and rock and roll. Over 25 bands, fun for the entire family. Carry-ins welcome. Kids 12 and under free. Buy your tickets and campsites and find out everything you need to know online at woodtickfestival.com. That's woodtickfestival.com. The Wood Tick Music Festival in Hermansville, Michigan. Paid another visit to my UP Trappers Association connection, Bob Whitens, to find out how to skin a mink. Okay, we were out uh, checking a few mink traps today and uh, picked up a few. And uh, usually when they bring them in, they're trying to mink are wet, of course. We bring them home, we always try to hang them in a cool spot here uh, where we got some air. This is my old skinning shed, and we always have a fan blowing on them. I like to leave them dry overnight to let furs nice and dry before we actually start to do the skinning. Okay, this is uh, a nice male mink right here. And the first thing we do, we cut the, the fur loose from the, the back feet of the animal and we skin that down, peel it all the way back until we get it exposed to the tail right here. Now we gotta be careful around this area because there's scent glands right in here. If you cut them, they're almost as strong as a skunk. So we don't really wanna cut them if we don't have to. The next thing we do is we peel it, pull the tailbone out. Now, when I was a kid, I used to pull it by hand and. Now I've finally decided to make some kind of a little rig here. So we have just a little puller here. This is a homemade deal. We just drop the mink in here, catch that tailbone and you pull it. Pulls the tailbone right out of that tail. Because you gotta have the bone out of the tail before you can market that animal. Now once we got them this far, then I like to clamp a leg here. I'm gonna clamp here so we can finish skinning them down. Now the animal separates pretty good here, but you got to be careful. You don't want to uh, cut the pelt, so you got to watch where you're cut. Again, we're cutting right between the membrane, between the skin and uh, the body of the animal. Once we get about this far here, and with generally what we can do here now is we can almost pull that rail off just like you're peeling off a sock. See, we just pull that right down until we get right to the front legs of the animal. One thing you like to see on a mink is if this part of the skin part is nice and white color here. When they're white, they indicate that this is a prime animal. If it's an early mink and it's not prime, uh, this is going to be a darker color here, that the flesh part of the hide. So this is a nice prime male mink, which is good to see. 
hopefully if the market holds up last year we got about 20 25 28 dollars for the male mink so we'll see how that goes this year again we're just getting the front legs out we pull them out and then we just cut off this the fur right here and then we continue to pull that hide down till you get to the ear area cut behind the ear get that free cut this other ear free all the while we're pulling on it a little bit to get some tension keep skinning down around to get to the eyes try to be careful so you don't make anything bigger cut than you have to get that eye separated from the body when you get to the lower lip area here what we do is we cut that skin right off on the lower lip just like that you don't have to have the, the lower lip on the animal then we can proceed to separate the rest from the nose and there we have a nice prime mink the next step would be to put them on a board and stretch them out what I do at this time of the year is I'm going to roll these up first side out and, and freeze them and then at a later date probably a week or so before the actual first sale I'll take them all out and sit in there and put them all up at once. We've got all different sized boards over here. This is the board that's used to put the large mink on. And if I was going to put it on the board, the mink would go on like so. Legs on one side, tail on the other. Of course, then we would take all the extra flesh off, get that mink on here the proper size, and then we'd pin the tail and open the tail all the way up and so on. Uh, if it was a female mink, then I would use a smaller board. What they like to have is that uh, they like all the, all the animals to be uniform size. They want all the males to be the same size and all the females to be the same size. You can see the difference in size. The reason for that is they want them all the same width. The, the larger males then are going to be longer, the larger females are going to be longer. So when they're graded, they're graded by length because they know they're all going to be the same width because we're using standard size boards. So uh, at this time, that's all I'm going to do with these mink. Then I'm not going to actually board it. I'm going to turn it first side out, and you can see what they look like first side out. And a mink, of course, has a real nice soft fur, characteristic of the little white spot underneath their neck. That's a nice male, nice male mink. So we're going to roll this and roll them up, put him in a nice big bag, put him in the freezer, and in a couple of weeks here, we'll have him out and on the board, all cleaned up and ready to go to the auction. Time for Only in the UP, the segment of the show that highlights the friendly, creative, crafty, and inventive spirit of those of us who live here. It's about that stuff that makes the UP the greatest place on earth to live. I traveled to Cornell where I met up with Phil Lobb, a creative fisherman who built some of the finest handmade nets found in the Midwest. Well, when I start building a net, you start with a, a board that you rip strips from. I tend to use my bandsaw because... I don't lose a strip every time you cut a strip with the width of the bandsaw blade, with the table saw blade. Once the strips are cut and sanded, then I soak them. I soak them in really hot water. And I'll change the water just before I go to bend them so that they'll be more pliable. And then I bend them around a form such as the one I got glued here or I have some wooden ones. This is my form for gluing them. I use a polyurethane glue, so it's a waterproof glue. Then once it's all glued up, it's removed from the form. This is the way it looks when it comes from the form. It's an interesting piece of wood. It's a piece of spalted yellow birch that my friend dug out of the mud. So he hauled it home and we cut it up and that's what was inside. Spalting is a term used a lot in wood turning. It's when the wood is starting to break down. It's the fungus in the wood that's causing the wood to break down. And you'll get various different colors of spalting and the most popular, of course, is any black line spalt. Then I like to add some trim pieces in the handle. This would be the final step of gluing. This, this net is fully laminated and ready to be flattened and then formed. Again, another piece of spalted yellow birch. Once the net's flattened, I run them through my drum sander to flatten the net. Then the net goes through the router to 
form all the roundovers on it. You have to drill the holes for your, to sew your net bag into the net. And those are spaced out. I just happen to space them out at one inch a piece. So you route the groove and then you mark each hole and drill the hole for to sew your bag in when your net is completed. This particular piece of wood inside here for the handle insert is curly cherry. The inner and outer strip on this hoop is uh, curly maple. But you won't really notice the figure in it until it's fully sanded and then a coat of oil is applied, a nice penetrating oil really blows the figure out on the, on the wood then. And uh, really showcases our figured hardwoods that are local. I only use local hardwoods, um, partly because I'm somewhat allergic to exotics, but also because the Upper Peninsula has the most gorgeous hardwoods that you can buy. And once this is all sanded out and I apply a coat of oil, then I put the finish on. And myself personally, I use a gunstock oil finish and I'll apply eight to 10 coats with a piece of satin. I, I might be just somewhat OCD, but I like the way the finish is. I've tried other finishes. They tend to look plastic and they're not comfortable. I do make some custom nets, custom ordered people ask, but most of the nets that I have in stock are made for me. They're what I like. The design of the net is what I like to fish with. Phil also creates a variety of wood turning works of art. If you're interested in wood turning, get together with a wood turning club. We have a local one in Ishpeming. It's called uh, Superior Land Wood Turners. They will gladly teach you how to get into wood turning. It's a really fun, gratifying little hobby. To find more of Phil's work, please pay him a visit on Facebook. A quick note for deer hunters. Do your part to help manage our deer herd by filling out the DNR's online questionnaire. The information gathered is used to evaluate hunter success and total deer harvest. You can find the link to this survey on the helpful links page of our website at realoutdoorsup.com. The 10-day muzzleloader season opened on the 7th. Good luck to all the muzzleloader hunters. If you didn't catch last week's show and you want to know more about keeping your muzzleloader clean, you can find that as well on our website at realoutdoorsup.com. A reminder to archery hunters, only hunters with a certified disability can use a crossbow during the late archery season. And I stopped in to visit Buck last week. He's in good spirits and on the road to recovery. As you can imagine, it's driving him crazy not being able to get out and enjoy the great outdoors. Buck, we wish you a speedy recovery. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next Monday night right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.